Uh, my name's uh, Charlie Jeffrey. I'm the Vice Chancellor of the University of York, and it's uh, a great pleasure to uh, welcome you all onto campus this evening to celebrate the launch of the School for Business and Society. Uh, before we get going, I need to do the, the housekeeping. No fire alarm expected if one goes off, exits to this side and the other side, and follow uh, the instructions of my colleagues. Um, that out of the way, uh, I shall be handing over in a moment to uh, Paul Kissack, who is the Group Chief Executive for the Joseph Roundtree Foundation and the Joseph Roundtree Housing Trust, who's going to chair the main event and introduce you to a fantastic panel of speakers you can see assembled behind me and on that screen over there. Uh, that makes me, I guess, the warm-up act. Um, so as the warm-up act, let me say a few words about the School for Business and Society. Uh, it's one of three new schools we're proud to have opened this term at the university, bringing together groundbreaking combinations of disciplines and subjects. Now the other two are firstly the School of Arts and Creative Technologies, which spans music, theatre, film, television, interactive and emerging media, uh, and integrates creative practice with cutting edge technology in teaching, uh, research and external engagement. Secondly, we have the School of Physics, Engineering and Technology, which spans pretty much everything from the origins of the universe in theoretical physics, all the way through to tech startups harnessing the technologies of the future via novel approaches and curriculums in engineering. Now those new combinations uh, are part of the University of York's vision for being a university for public good. Uh, and they will through exciting research and teaching opportunities create new ways of generating social benefit from our work. And that's exactly what this university was set up to do. The founders uh, of this university back in the early 1960s thought we should be contributing to the amelioration of human life and conditions. They thought we should have, I quote, an interest in social betterment, and that should be honored in the new university. Now, in many ways, the School for Business and Society reflects, or, or Bob, it honors uh, that legacy. Uh, it combines and amplifies the university's strengths in responsible business management, social policy, social work, and public management, to create an environment that will help develop the ethical leaders of tomorrow. Uh, we think the school is uniquely placed to lead business and public policy action to tackle complex social and environmental issues and deliver sustainable economic growth. Working across disciplinary boundaries, it will deliver lasting social and economic impact through its research, through the skills and values of the students it educates, and through its collaborations with partners across business, public and third sectors, working with their managers and with policymakers to build more sustainable communities, new economic opportunities, fairer societies uh, and positive environmental outcomes. You may have had a chance to get a sense of some of that in the exhibition uh, in the atrium outside before. It'll be there afterwards and you can have a look at it again with a, a glass of something or other in your hand. So um, that's something to follow tonight's panel discussion. Uh, and now with the warm up act over, uh, we move onward uh, to that panel discussion. So I'm gonna hand over now to Paul Kissack to introduce you to the, to the meat of the event and to the panel. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Charlie, and um, uh, thank you very much for the invite to, to uh, host the panel discussion this evening. Absolute pleasure to be here at the launch of the new School for Business and Society. Um, as uh, Charlie mentioned, I'm uh, lucky enough to be the Chief Executive of the Joseph Roundtree Foundation and Housing Trust, um, uh, an organisation that carries a name which in many respects is synonymous, uh, not just with York, but with business and with society, a, a pioneer uh, of um, the role that business can play in York and indeed across the country in terms of ameliorating some of our biggest social challenges. 
and to some degree that is uh, what we're due to talk about this evening. So we have a, a, an exam question in front of us, uh, which is how can universities collaborate with public and private sector organisations for public good? Um, undoubtedly, the societal challenges we face in the 21st century are many and uh, diverse from the climate crisis uh, and the challenge of environmental sustainability through food and fuel poverty, social care, mental health, public accountability, the list goes on, many complex issues affecting people's daily lives. Um, so how can we tackle such a wide range of ever evolving social and economic and environmental challenges? And how can universities work in collaboration across sectors, regionally, nationally, and indeed internationally to overcome them? Uh, the good news for me is that I don't have to answer those questions uh, because we have a fantastic panel who are going to have a go at answering the questions. Uh, and the way this works is that I'm going to invite each one of our panelists in turn to give about five minutes of uh, an answer to those questions. Uh, we'll run through our four panelists in turn. Um, the chances, chances are that at the end of that, we will have completely answered those questions and there will be no questions left at which point we can just exit through the door you came in and go and have a drink. If, on the other hand, there are seem to be some loose ends and complex questions you want to get into, uh, and I have a few, um, then we have microphones we'll be handing around so that people uh, in the audience can put their questions to our panelists, and we'll have a bit of a conversation that will run through to about 10 to or 5 to 8. Um, so on that note, I will introduce our first um, panelist, uh, Sanjay uh, Bandari, who's a recent honorary graduate of the University of York. Welcome back. Um, and also chair of uh, Kick It Out, England's fo England football's leading equality and inclusion charity. Um, so uh, over to you for five minutes of answering the exam question. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Paul. So yeah, maybe I'll just talk about a couple of parts of my portfolio first as to why I'm in this seat. So I do, I have about eight or nine different jobs. I'm a jack of all trade. And the second part of that sentence is also true. Um, so, uh, but everything I do has a focus on either innovation, inclusion or sport. So uh, I'm the chair of Kick It Out. Uh, our mission is to eradicate discrimination, and make football a game where everyone feels they belong. Um, uh, I'm also an investor in, in a in diversity and inclusion business, uh, and I'm on the board of a, uh, the Lawn Tennis Association, so the governing body for British tennis, so looking at how we can make tennis uh, more inclusive. From an innovation perspective, I'm also chair of the Satellite Applications Catapult, which sits at the heart of innovation in the UK space technology industry. So most of my team are down in Cornwall this week at the Virgin Orbit launch with uh, George Freeman, the, the science minister. So before we ask how, we should really ask why. Actually, why, why, why are business, why is business, why is it their responsibility to drive social change? Why is it universities' responsibility to drive social change? Isn't that the job of governments? Don't governments reflect in a democratic society, contemporary mores, and develop social policy? And so I'd say that there are two pincer forces that make that uh, uh, not quite irrelevant, but mean that business is more important than governments. And, and those forces come from bottom and top to some degree. So one is by 2030, half of the workforce will be Gen Zs or alphas. Uh, when I started work in 1990, it was expected that I would have, someone like me would have three to seven employers during my lifetime. I had four, now I have about 10, but I had four in my full-time career. Uh, now it's expected that new people joining the workforce will have two to three times that. We live in a reverse world. When I started, if we had two years on a CV, that was a sign of something dodgy, that this person was found out and don't hire this person. Now, if someone stays longer than two years, that's a sign of someone dodgy, that they haven't got ambition and they're not getting the experiences they need and they're not taking control of their career. So, and what do those young people want? They want to work in organizations which have purpose and deliver more than the bottom line. That's one pincer movement. The other thing is that Larry Fink is far more important than Rishi Sunak. So for those of you new, who know, Larry Fink is the CEO of BlackRock. BlackRock is the world's largest investment manager. It has $8 trillion worth of assets under management. 
it is the world's biggest investor. Every year, Larry Fink likes, writes a letter to all his investee companies saying, I want you to deliver more than the bottom line. This is about more than shareholder value. So he is the driving force, along with some of the other uh, uh, asset managers, behind the ESG movement. So that's why uh, you know, business and universities matter more than governments in driving social change and can have more impact. So what is the role of universities in driving societal change? So in my two areas around innovation and equality and inclusion. So in innovation, look, traditionally, universities have been, are already part of that ecosystem. They are um, uh, magnets for global talent attraction. They are R&D hotbeds. They help to develop future skills. Our science minister wants the UK to be a science superpower. Uh, that we can develop the skills of resilience, agility, and attitudes to risk so that we become more entrepreneurial. When I was a kid, we were encouraged to do a safe job. There are no safe jobs anymore. The rate at which jobs change and new jobs are invented and old jobs fall out of the, out of, uh, out of the workforce is getting faster and faster and faster. So actually the skills we need from our young people is resilience and agility and those, that entrepreneurial flair. Well, universities are the great place to build that future workforce. The challenge I would set for universities is, particularly around R&D, I think as a country, we have far too much focus on R and not enough on D. We're, you know, I would say we're brilliant at R and almost terrible at D, which is why we, in, for SME companies, we have lots of S and we don't have very much ME because we don't really have many medium-sized enterprises. We don't really have access to patient capital. And that's partly because the government thinks and they're not the only ones, think that innovation is only technology innovation. And it's not. The innovation is technology innovation, it's market innovation, and it's business model innovation. So if you want an example, look at Elon Musk. N N SpaceX is not technology innovation. All that technology existed. What he did was change the business model. He collapsed the supply chains so that he made launch very cheap. Tesla, none of that technology is new. What he did was to think about building the market. And there's a clue in the names of the cars. His models are Model S, Model 3, Model X, Model Y. It spells sexy. That was his job. His job was to make electric vehicles sexy. There is virtually nothing that's really innovative or new in the technology. He assembled it and developed the market forces. So I think, how can universities be more entrepreneurial in thinking about how we, how we develop ideas that can lead to money and create wealth. And the reason why it's important to create wealth is that that enables us, you know, I know that money can't buy us happiness, but as Woody Allen says, it does allow us to look for it in more places, but it does also allow us to deliver on our purpose uh, much more effectively if we deliver for profit. And then in terms of social change, what can universities do? What's the role of universities? I think it's, it, it comes back to building resilient, agile and inclusive future leaders. And, and as a hotbed of ideas, dialogue, and theory of change. My one plea would be, we live in a, a society and an age where um, we, have be, we, we have too much debate and not enough dialogue. And there's a difference between debate and dialogue. I come into a debate aiming to prove that you're wrong and I'm right. I come into a dialogue aiming to thinking I might be wrong and trying to understand your perspective. Now, actually, we've gone further than a world of debate. We're actually a world of parallel monologues. Nobody actually listens to anyone else to try and argue with them. We just wait for the pause and shout at each other. And that is exacerbated by social media. So we need a cultural change in our society to become a culture of dialogue. We have two ears and one mouth. God designed us pretty well. There's a clue. They're meant to be used in that proportion. So with that, I'm going to use my ears now and shut up. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ajay. And lots and lots to think about and get into uh, in conversation there. Um, absolutely recognise that point about uh, dialogue um, and, and debate. And one of the questions I think is always good to ask us is, when was the last time we changed our mind <laughs> on something? Uh, and it's often quite a difficult question to answer, honestly. And I don't mean changing your mind on picking something off a menu. I mean, something that you sort of really think you've thought about and a view you hold, when was the last time you changed your mind? And if you're not changing your mind, 
you, you might have stopped thinking and you might stop listening. Um, also, I love the idea that electric cars are sexy. Um, I've just parked my <laughs> Nissan Leaf outside in the car park. Uh, that's not been not, my experience. Not, not all honest, electric cars. Are sexy. Not all electric cars. Okay, point taken. Um, Sanjay, thanks very much. Um, we'll now move on to our, our um, second panelist, uh, Shardé uh, Shardé Brazil, uh, program manager uh, for place-based impact investing at the Impact Investing Institute. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's such a jargony title. We've really <laughs> got to make that a little bit snappier. Um, but uh, thanks very much for having me, as I say. Um, and so I'm Shardy. I really recognize, I'm definitely on the latter career path that um, Sanjay describes. Um, I've got a background in political advice, and then I moved into public sector delivery. Um, and now I run the Place-Based Impact Investing Program at the Impact Investing Institute. Um, I thought I'd uh, use my five minutes to give you a little bit of a flavor of, of the Institute and what we do, um, run through the kind of three main opportunity areas that I see for universities to collaborate with the public sector and the private sector, um, and then finish on a kind of a, a gentle challenge. Um, so at the Impact Investing Institute, we're an independent nonprofit founded in 2019, um, and we've given ourselves the, the modest aim um, of changing capital markets so that they're fairer and work better for people and the planet. So it won't take us long. Um, no problem. We've got it all under control. Um, and we work with large investors, including BlackRock, actually, uh, like Sunday mentions, um, but also including kind of pensions, insurers, family offices, and charitable endowments um, to increase the number of impact investments they make. And now we define impact investments, and I write it down every time so that I don't get it wrong, um, which are investments with the intention to generate positive, measurable social and environmental impact alongside a financial return. And my work uh, on the PLACE program adds a kind of geographic dimension to that. So we try and work with investors um, to help them make investments that address the specific needs of a particular place. And so universities for me are incredibly uh, interesting um, areas of opportunity. And I think the three main kind of forces that make universities kind of indisputable allies in the place-based impact investing movement. Um, the first is that universities have a kind of endowment there's an endowment engine that powers them so 100 universities invest 15 billion pounds so there's there's a big chunk of capital up for grabs there and the second is that universities are home to kind of incredible brain power so both academics and the next generation of students and the majority of whom in both camps i think um care deeply about climate racial equity and creating a better world uh, the third is the, is the role that universities play in their places. So we know that whole towns grow up around universities and they're the kind of lifeblood of the places that, that they inhabit. And, and so, you know, they're really, they're really important actors in places. And when you combine all of those three, you know, a powerful engine uh, in the public markets and capital markets um, and activists kind of energized to create positive change and the strongest possible connection to place, you see that universities have, you know, frankly, an incredible opportunity um, to positively contribute to the fabric of the societies in which they're situated. And I think they can only really do that in, in collaboration. So by aligning the investment strategies of their endowments, universities unlock significant capital to deliver positive impact. Um, alongside, it's important to say, the financial return that, that universities rely on to secure their futures. Um, and that, that second point, by collaborating, that, that brain power point, by collaborating with the third sector and local authorities, universities can help bring the conversation about impact at kind of down from 30,000 feet into the real world. And through partnership, you know, they can bring their research to bear on real world issues like community finance, like sustainability, um, you know, harnessing that brain power that's inherent in institutions like this um, to support positive local impact. And one example that actually I was talking um, to Joan about just before we started is that there is a massive skills shortage in um, ESG, which is environmental social government, governance and impact in the city of London. You know, all of these graduates who are going to do finance grad schemes, there's something like 8,000 vacancies in ESG and impact. There's a real skills shortage. Um, and so universities can, can you know, play a role in helping us plug that gap. And then finally, you know, while recognizing that universities are global in their reach and kind of cultural footprint, they are inherently local. You know, they exist in places. And um, the University of York, um, as Charlie mentions, has a civic mission and a responsibility 
um, to uh, support York and its surrounding places. Um, and it's so great to see this university taking that really seriously. Um, and I think not only through the launch of this school, but also um, through the kind of participation of your senior academics and leaders in uh, partnership projects across the city, uh, like the York Partnership Board. And you know those kinds of collaborations, like the York Partnership Board, are the sort of bedrock of um, place-based impact investing. And they, that's because they kind of, they enable a place to come together and articulate a shared vision for itself. And that attracts investors because they're clear about what a place wants and that frankly de-risks their investment in that place in the long term. So there's a real kind of stewardship role there for universities and public um, sector collaboration to play in attracting investment into places. And then I said I'd um, end on a kind of, a gentle challenge um, and that's that I think from an investment perspective it's quite easy and quite tempting for universities to lean on the support that they give their own tech spin outs um, as kind of and, and count those as the contribution that they make to the local economy um, and you know count those as an impact investment but I'd like to sort of challenge that you know just a little bit in that a university's impacts don't rest largely with their high tech spin outs. And that's partly because, you know, finding the next unicorn, even in the instances where um, those organizations are innovating in impactful sectors like medicine and education, that actually often simply exacerbates wealth inequality. Tech clusters so rarely reach deeper into the communities in which they're based. Um, and, and that, you know, by attracting high, highly paid specialists, often they can again exacerbate existing problems in the local community, like the cost of housing, for example. And that's not to say it can't be done well. There are organizations like um, North Star Ventures who take their social impact really seriously and invest in university spin outs across themes like um, healthy aging, the future of work and learning, the future of place um, and climate tech. Um, and they're, but but the, the way they do that is through meaningful partnership with organizations like the Newcastle Center for Aging. And so I think, you know, tackling societal challenges is never about any one specific sector. And arguably it's particularly never about just tech. It's about improving places and the lives of the people in them. And I think that's where collaboration is, is so crucial and where universities can have a really pivotal role. Brilliant. Shardy, thank you very much. And good to finish on a provocation. Hopefully there are some people who are feeling a bit provoked by that and no doubt will be thinking about the questions gently, they're going to be gently, gently <laughs> provoked and, and fire back some friendly questions um, in a few minutes. Um, I'll turn to our third panellist now. I'm delighted to welcome Erin Sahan, who is the uh, Business and Enterprise Lead at the Donut Economics Action Lab. Um, you may have noticed he's uh, on the screen, not with us today. I, I actually have no idea where you are. You might actually be in a room next door, just choosing to come in on the screen. I'm, um, I'm very shy, so I'm hiding in a closet somewhere and I'm dialing in instead. But no, I'm, I'm in Oxford and, and for family reasons, wasn't able to travel, but delighted to be with you. Brilliant. Uh, Erin, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, guys. It's it's wonderful to be here to, to talk with you all about the future of business and the future of business schools, as you can see from uh the, the image by me i work on donut economics and as a reminder what donut economics tells us is that we live on a planet that has got two very critical boundaries it's got the planetary boundaries that we are currently exceeding so these are the nine aspects of our earth system that we are in overshoot of carbon biodiversity loss uh you know fresh water withdrawals uh air pollution, chemical pollution, all these things that, that are critical, that we cannot negotiate with our planet on and we must live within. The inner circle is, is all about the social foundation because we cannot just shrink our economy at any cost. We need an economy that creates livelihoods, that creates energy, food, all the essentials of life. And it's between these two circles, these two concentric circles, that there is a donut shaped space, which is that safe and just space for humanity. So that's the macro picture that is the guiding force because that is the scientific reality of us living as a species and as a civilization on this wet spinning rock that, that we all depend upon. But at the same time, the ideas of economics and business and finance from the 20th century 
are no longer fit for purpose to address these challenges. They weren't designed, our economies, our businesses, our financial markets weren't designed for the, the challenges of planetary boundaries and social foundations. They were designed for capital scarcity. They were designed for a very different world where we did not know about the transgression that we were creating on our planet's complex Earth system, nor were we aware of the spiraling inequality we could create by continuing with some of these models and ideas. And what is the role of business then in all of this? If we're looking at an economy that needs to transition and transform, and we're looking at a world that is in multiple crises at the same time, we need a business world that can pursue bold ideas. Bold ideas like factories behaving like forests, factories that sequester carbon, factories that clean groundwater and air water. We need a supply chain that are able to distribute opportunity and value much more equitably. We need a fundamental redesign of business actions. We've been working for the last year on ideas around what is holding business back. We know the ideas. We know about modular product design. We know about distributive models of employment and practices with communities. What's holding these back? Why are they stuck in the niche? Well, what we found is that the ideas are in there bubbling away in the business world, but it's the deep design of business that is structurally holding business back. It's the rigid margin requirements or the capital expenditure processes that mean that some of the most regenerative ideas don't get funded, don't get investment internally, even though they are viable, they're not profit maximizing. So challenging these ideas has become a little bit of a trend now. We're seeing examples like faith in nature that are saying, hey, I'm going to put nature on my board. I'm going to have a board member that is from Lawyers for Nature with a voting seat on my board to bring in that voice of nature. Examples like Patagonia, which I'm sure you heard of, which made Earth's only shareholder, innovating in ownership models that separate share classes between those who hold the power and the voting rights and those who hold the, uh, the dividend rights, essentially the rights to the surplus. And of course, examples like Richer Sounds, which converted to employee ownership which fundamentally changes its relationship with its community and with its employees. All of these are starting to happen. And what's really clear is that if we're going to survive on this planet, we need these innovations to go from the margins into the mainstream. And this is where business schools come in. And this is where amazing initiatives like those at the new business school here are beginning to, to push these ideas into the mainstream. Because what you give is the legitimacy. You give it credibility. You give understanding and you bring in attention and insights that really start to scale these ideas up. Initiatives like I Fix Our Food has been a phenomenally important thought leader in this process, has created ideas that have been brought into both the policy space as well as the entrepreneurial space. So that's my broader challenge, my broader idea and inspiration that I think that business schools can play in terms of shaping the debate, in terms of the narrative that they can help drive, and in terms of the innovation they can create, both with students, businesses, society, and policymakers alike. Thank you for the time to, to speak. I think I stuck exactly to the five minutes, but I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the conversation and joining in. Erich, brilliant. Thank you very much. And thank you for sticking to exactly the five minutes. Very impressive. Um, I'm going to move us uh, swiftly on to our final panellist, um, who many of you will know, uh, Bob Doherty, the Dean of this new School for Business and Society uh, here at the University of York. Thanks, uh, thanks Paul. Uh, first of all, I just want to welcome everybody. Uh, it's just great to see so many people from across the university, but so many people from outside the university, both in York, Yorkshire, and also uh, nationally as well from public, private and third sectors. It's just fantastic. And just I want to also mention that we have two uh, international visitors here. We have our partner City College who were here uh, this evening. And we also have Mahidon University at the back, all the way from Thailand, who came especially uh, for the launch of the new school uh, for business and society. So uh, thank you very much. It's a great uh, you know, audience. And, and, and we feel, as panel speakers, feel really privileged that you who wanted to spend the time with us uh, this evening. Uh, I think, first of all, I think we have to acknowledge that time is running out. Uh, I think Erin put that very, very well. If you think of serious growing inequalities, if you think of the climate catastrophe, 
you know, we have to first of all, all acknowledge that, that that is the situation. Um, yet at the same time, I'm afraid that in academia, we still tend to work in our silos. And, um, you know, universities as, as well as the economic sectors are, are guilty of that. However, at the University of York, we reached an inflection point. And in creating the new school for business and society, that was a bold step because never before, and we've looked all over the world to try and find an, an academic school that brings social policy and social work together with business, really to speak to government and to speak to business, to tackle the grand challenges that we've all been talking about. I don't think we, we've looked all over the world and we haven't found one. So we are unique, we are distinctive. And we feel that you have to bring this, these disciplines together to tackle the grand challenges that we've been talking about. Um, you know, you need new interdisciplinary knowledge, new evidence, and we also need new action oriented interventions. And we have that in the school, and I'm gonna say a, a little bit more, more about that um, uh, later. We also believe that you can't tackle these wicked problems uh, without bringing uh, private sector, uh, government, and also uh, third sectors together. You know, in collaboration together, we have a better chance with academia to tackle these, uh, these really uh, uh, grand challenges that we've, been, that we've been talking about. And I think universities occupy, I think uh, one of the panelists mentioned it earlier, we, we occupy a unique position. We have convening power. I think in our work, in our research, and we all recognize this, we're able to bring stakeholders together with different perspectives. That's quite a powerful thing. We also, and there are students here tonight, we also uh, give the leaders of the future the kind of tools and the mindset to lead change. And I think Nelson Mandela said, didn't he, that the most powerful weapon for change is education. You know, and we, we, really, we really have a lot of responsibility as, a, as, a, as universities, and as a school for a business uh, and society. Uh, now, in the school, we already, already have many examples of this in action. So we, the exhibition outside is just a snapshot of the work that we're doing. Uh, you know, we just selected just a, a few programs to illustrate that the school, the, the previous parent departments, management, and also social policy and social work are working together on some of these challenges in the new school. And um, I don't like picking out just a couple of examples, but I am going to, because I think they really illustrate uh, the, the importance of this interdisciplinary work. It's actually based on, fundamentally, it's based on the strength of the disciplines, but actually bringing the strength of the disciplines together in an interdisciplinary way can tackle these problems in a more effective uh, manner. So the first one, is uh, the Economic Social Research Council for Vulnerability and Policing Futures. The University of York has never won an e ESRC center uh, funding before. It's never won it. And this is our first uh, ESRC center and it's in our school and we're very proud of it. Now, why I wanted to mention the center is because it brings 38 partners together with academia. It brings North Yorkshire, uh, um, uh, police force, Merseyside police. It brings charities like um, Age Concern, homeless charities, anti-slavery international, um, you know, mental health charities. It brings private sector bodies together to tackle the 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 future of policing, because often the the police have to deal with very vulnerable people, you know, that are either caught up in slavery caught up in uh, mental health issues, and they're right at the front line. So we are providing new knowledge, new evidence, new insights that help the future of police and this kind of precarity that we, we, we find ourselves uh, presiding over in, in our society. That's just one example, and it's a fantastic example. And, and Charlie Lloyd, the principal investigator is here tonight if you want to speak to him about it. The other one, is, uh, and you'll see the, the display outside is, is Fix Our Food. And this is a program in the school. It's a five-year program, um, six million pounds, and it brings together 
and some of the businesses are here. I see Shepherd's Purse at the back, Caroline Bell. Um, it brings together small, medium-sized and large businesses, and Spark Yorker here, who were a partner in the, in the bid as well, brings businesses together with schools, you know, schools right across Yorkshire, but also with government, local government, local economic partnership, the, um, the, the local authorities, North Yorkshire County Council, but also DEFRA and the Food Standards Agency, and, and Rick Mumford's here from the Food Standards Agency, who's a deputy chief scientist. And we, we tackle the wicked problems in the food system, dietary ill health, uh, planetary ill health, soil health. We work with a group of farmers in Yorkshire called Regenerative Future Farmers, about 400 of them. So we work with these pockets of innovation. And um, those are just two examples of, uh, of, of our mission, I guess, in action, bringing the sectors together with academia to solve these grand, grand uh, challenges. There are loads of other uh, examples. I haven't got the time to mention because I know I'm already over the five minutes. But, uh, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. And, and we also have plans for a new um, teaching provision to, to which we, we, we want to develop a, an MBA that has an emphasis on public good. We'd love to develop an undergraduate program that is called Business and Society that brings all these issues together. I think there'll be, you know, a lot of our students are really, you know, the, the people are looking for that kind of uh, degree. Um, and, and the final thought for me is that universities have always had the responsibility of prepare, preparing tomorrow's leaders. Uh, but today, this is perhaps a greater responsibility than any time in our history, I feel. And that's why we brought the two, that's why we formed this new school, the School for Business and Society. You know, because um, uh, I, I think it's, you know, other people from other business schools have said, I wish we were doing this. You know, that's what people have said to me. And I, I want to say to everybody here, whether you work in, in another department in the university, whether you work in business, whether you work in government, come and join us on this journey. You know, we want to work with you. We can develop and co-create amazing research together, amazing teaching. We want to develop a job family at York called Academics of Practice. So we want people to come in and talk to our students about, you know, people like Sanjay. We want him to come in. I, I hear he's moving to Ilkley. So that is really, really good. Uh, I'm really pleased about that. Uh, and so we want people to come in and talk to our students about the, you know, the, the, the kind of challenges of our time. And um, yeah, please come and join us in this journey. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank Thanks. you very much, Bob. Four terrific uh, contributions to the question in front of us and great to finish on that um, invitation. Um, an invitation now for you to take part in uh, the conversation. We have two-ish, two, I think, roving mics. Uh, so please just, if you have a question, uh, which could be for an individual member of the panel, it could be for the, the full panel, um, put up your hands now and we will send a microphone your way. Don't be shy. If you are shy, I'll ask one of my questions instead, but they're not <laughs> as good as yours. So put your hands up if you have a question to ask. We've got a hand up, gentleman in, in the cap. I do firmly believe in... Uh the the objective of the panel today and uh, but uh, we cannot uh, meanwhile uh, turn our eyes away from the fact that a uh, lot of actors in the economy are utilizing these kind of emotions for their financial advantage for instance uh, when Sabrina's Oxley Act was launched so a lot of ESG rating companies suddenly popped up and then whenever these kind of regulations are, or objectives comes, then some actors, uh, they try to make money out of it. And in the process, what happens is that the core agenda gets kind of diverted. So there the critics come in. But what I also see that the critics are not taken very seriously. So my question is, do you think that the critics should also be an integral part of the dialogue to make, to take this agenda uh, in a more effective way forward. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Do we think the critics should be part of the dialogue? Or perhaps, I mean, I'm expecting most of the panelists will say yes to that, but perhaps the question is how to bring critics into the process of making uh, making this better. Sanjay, well, can I get As someone who's advocated a culture of dialogue, of course, it'd be 
odd for me to say no. We should, <laughs> yeah, of course we should we should engage people who are critics, but it it it's also how you do that in a way that doesn't divert you away from your core mission. And so the so the, the challenge is in in anything when you're trying to drive change. In my experience, there are always critics, right? My, my, my definition, I've done leadership training for also when I, when I was a partner at EY for our future partners and say, you know, two things. One, welcome in the world of us and them. Welcome to them. You're no longer us. And so the second thing is just get used to managing an ambient level of disappointment in life, right? The sooner you get used to managing an ambient level of disappointment, the happier you will be. Because there's always going to be someone who's annoyed with you. There's always going to be someone who's going to be criticizing you. There's always, you, you can't please absolutely everybody. So make your significant other a non-negotiable. Everybody else, including your boss, including your clients who pay you, they're all negotiable, right? That's the way I, that's my attitude to dealing with critics. I have to have a vision for where I want my organization to go. I take all those soundings and the input, but this is, we, you know, leadership is not a democracy, right? It's not, everyone has a vote. Everyone has a voice and I listen, but leadership is about then making a decision and going in, and sometimes you'll get it wrong, but it's better to make a decision than keep on listening, keep on listening, keep on listening, and you never do anything. So absolutely, you have to engage critics in the dialogue, but don't necessarily, and, and listen where you think you might need to change tack, but don't let that deflect you. I'll give you as a practical example. Look, it'd be very, very easy for me to kick it out to just talk to the Guardian. I can get in the Guardian anytime I want, but I need to talk to the Telegraph. I need to talk to the Mail. I need to talk to GB News. I need to go on Julia Hartley Brewer's show on Talk TV because that's where the people are who disagree with me and I need to change their minds. That's why I mean, so of course we have to engage with critics, but don't let that deflect you from the mission. Right, thank you. I, I think just something I'd add in, in the kind of, so, so talking about kind of greenwashing and impact washing in the sort of financial markets and investment world, which is sort of where, where I live. Um, I think the, the, yes, absolutely. But I think the important thing for me is that, you know, impact, transparency and accountability answers a lot of those questions so there will always be critics absolutely um but if you're clear transparent and accountable for what you're trying to achieve then people can kind of choose for themselves you don't need to get into a, a specific argument with someone because you can just say well here's all here's all the info you know anyone who's interested can look at it and and make an informed decision for, the, for themselves so i think in in kind of from an investment perspective um, what we're really kind of trying to drive for is is proper transparency and accountability on impact so that you can't get away with impact washing and greenwashing and everybody kind of knows you can't get away with it. Um, and we're working with the FCA and others uh, to do just that. Erin, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've got a, a quote around the three horizons approach that I know that the business school um, is, is also, uh, the school of business and society, I, I need to get used to calling it, uh, is also very close to as an approach. And when when disruptive innovation meets business as usual, something gets transformed. And we've seen a lot of examples of the disruptive innovation being co-opted and being transformed to retain business as usual. You know, when Uber was set up, it, it, it might have been fantastic at the time, but it brought in H1 or business as usual finance with the disruptive invasion of platform technology. And what we got was well short of what platform technology could have potentially delivered in terms of regenerative and distributive outcomes. That's not inevitable, but I think we need to have a sense of skepticism around how does business as usual engage with these new emerging ideas, whether it is ESG, whether it is regenerative agriculture, whether it was fair trade, which is the world I, I worked in for a long time, we've seen this happen time and time again. So we need that skeptical perspective just because business as usual, the mainstream players are engaging with an idea. It does not mean that this is necessarily the way towards transformation that we wanted to see. So that's the main thing I, I would highlight. And, and as a flow on from that, I think the litmus test is, is there structural change? Because there's going to be 
some things that are within the win-win scenarios of the current structures of business and finance. There'll be scenarios where you do you increase your returns certainly by doing the right thing, by having fantastic ecological outcomes, by having fantastic social outcomes. That's great. That's going to get taken care of by the market. And but that's the stuff that is not sufficient. There's a lot of things that need to happen that are not pure win-wins, where there are trade-offs. And to address those, we have to get structural change. And that structural change is about changing leadership models, changing governance models. Who's got who's got a vote on the board? Not just the voice sometimes, but being careful with that, not going to the extremes of you know, economic democracy to a point where we are crippled to into indecision. But on the other side, not being stuck in 20th century models that haven't moved the needle either and kept the status quo going. So let's have a look at structural change. And let's keep in mind that when disruptive innovation meets business as usual, something is transformed. Thank you. Well, yeah, I, mean, I think it's a really insightful question, Jurai. Thank you for it. Um, I think that... Um, you know, when you're doing, when you when you're trying to create social change, and there's a number of social change activists here, um, it's really difficult. You you you're often in the in the public eye. There's an old phrase, isn't there? You can't do right for doing wrong. Um, and, and and young people often get really disillusioned by the criticism they get when they're trying to create change. And I always say to them, this is normal. This is what happens when you when you're trying to pioneer. You know, you will get criticised. But I actually think. The, and we, I learned this when, when I was involved in working in policy for three years and helping Henry Dimbleby with the national food strategy. And we did a series of public dialogues all over the country. And, and I was involved in them, helped, explaining the food system. And we had all sorts of different stakeholder perspectives in the room. We purposefully chose people who would be critics and people who would be pro. Because you, if you take a systems approach, you need to get all stakeholder perspectives in the room and listen to them. And um, so I, I, I agree with everybody here. You need to, you need to, you need to engage in the dialogue uh, with the critics to hear what, they, what their perspective is. Otherwise, you'll, you'll create unintended consequences in, in the solutions that you create. So that's my answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got time for uh, certainly another question. Got a hand up over there. Fascinated, by the way, to hear that you're using the Three Horizons framework. And you don't know, we, we are too at uh, Joseph Ranch Foundation. And, and that challenge of is the work we're doing making the current slightly better, or is it genuinely trying to craft the new? Yeah. Uh, and sometimes when you're embarking on social change, what you don't know, actually, no. you just have to sort of get on with it, and you find out part way through which yeah. which road you're on. I mean, there's a couple of people in the in the in the, um, the lecture theatre. Who, who were experts in using the Three Horizons process. You, uh, we maybe have a chat with them later. We have always, have, always yeah. have vacancies at the foundation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, gentleman <laughs> with his hand up. I guess a question for Bob, really. Um, clearly what's going on here is very good. Um, I wondered from his uh, position uh, with regards to CABS, the Chartered Association of Business Schools, they were making or appeared to be making moves in the public good direction uh, as far as schools went with where that's got to, whether that has made any progress. And then secondly, the second component of that, uh, the UNPR uh, their principles responsible uh, management uh, and we're looking at uh, evalu alternative methods of evaluation of business schools to reflect the public good. And I wondered if, uh, if Bob could offer anything from, you know, on the latest on that from his, uh, his experience and position. Yeah, uh, th thanks Neil for that question. The, um... The, the Chartered Association of Business Schools actually had an annual conference this week on Monday and Tuesday, and, and there was a panel on interdisciplinary research tackling grand challenges, and I was one of the panel speakers uh, at that. And um, I do think there is a move, you're right, in business, school, in business schools per se, to look more at public value uh, and public good, but there's no other business school that's done what we've done. Um, you know, and brought, um, you know, social policy together with business and social work because still business schools are working in kind of single domain. Um, in, you know, they're, they're finding it difficult. What we've done, we've been very successful in getting into disciplinary grants because we've gone beyond the boundary of the business school. So I think it's good that business schools are looking at public value, but they have to take it one step further and really collaborate more with with other disciplines and, and because in a way business 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 and society schools 
are inherently interdisciplinary. We've got in our school, we've got sociologists, we've got historians, you know, blah, blah, blah. We've got all sorts of different uh, disciplines. So we should really be front and center in that, in that debate. And I think public good for us is part of our heritage. Not, all the business, not every other business school has, and every other university has public good as part of its heritage. Uh, and um, obviously that rain tree heritage that we have is quite a special distinctive component. Um, so I do think one of the things we, we would like to do, we're not there yet, we've got a lot of integration to do as a school, uh, is at some point we'd like to measure our public good impact. Uh, I know the university is starting to think and do that, and we should be doing it as a school as well. And we, we you know, those people who are involved in this measuring social impact and environmental impact, we'd love to talk to you because we do want to do that at some point. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Bob. I think we have a question just next to Thanks very much indeed. Um, I'm part of Enterprise Works, the university's new small business growth hub, um, and we work to drive social change using enterprise. We've been working with the region's social enterprises, um, and many of them are struggling to compete in a corporate environment. And I just wondered um, from the panel, how do we ensure that social impact is given appropriate and due value to enable them to compete in this sort of setup and what universities can do to support that? Great. And rather than do the usual run, I'm going to go to uh, Erinch first, if that's OK. Um, uh, and then I'll take it through the other way. Thank, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I can answer it from a few perspectives. Um, I, I sit on the board of the Social Enterprise World Forum, so I'm quite familiar with the commercial challenges that social enterprises of all walks and all sectors around the world are, are facing. We're beginning to see some really interesting initiatives in social procurement whether it is corporate procurement or public procurement, all sorts of organizations that are beginning to use the perspective of, uh, can we buy from social enterprises? Can we buy from impact enterprises and really assess the social value of our procurement? Um, I think there, there are significant opportunities there for the University of York and specifically the School of Business and Society to support those perspectives, to, to join up and link up maybe with programs like Enterprise Works at, at the school to try to link them up with all those in initiatives that are beginning to create those market positions and market opportunities for social enterprises. But but I salute you in, in, in creating that opportunity for social enterprises locally, because often they're getting to the bits of society and beginning to create the opportunities in, in more marginalized ways where the rest of the market is often leaving people behind. So I think it is a critical challenge. And of course, there's the access to finance side of the equation as well, which I won't go into. There's particularly a role there as well for universities and business schools to begin to, to bring the right people around the table and support social enterprises to talk the language of investors, to make a case and bring in that investment without leading to mission loss or, or loss of purpose of the, of the social enterprise. It's so little time. Um, so I think there's a couple of things. I think the so at the Institute, we're doing a really exciting piece of work with community development finance institutions on supporting um, local SMEs and trying to capitalize that sector better so that you can get more resilient local ecosystems that, that are doing exactly exactly what you mentioned. But I guess the, the other thing is, is that so at the Institute, really, we kind of really believe in a sort of triple bottom line approach where risk return and impact are all given Kind of equal weight in investment decisions whether that's you know across asset classes whether that's from sme finance all the way through to kind of real estate investment um and i think that you know that that's kind of gaining a little bit of traction the, the number of people that sort of share that belief is kind of does feel like it's growing every day but i think it, bringing it back to the role of universities i think you know schools like this can really help that movement by giving it a kind of intellectual foundation and um, and really kind of kicking it about and, and testing it in a way that you know the industry itself struggles to do and so i think um you know that is that is a really exciting role that, that universities can play um, in helping bring that that triple bottom line approach more into the mainstream because i guess you know 100 years ago the idea of considering a risk as well as the return of an investment was sort of like revolutionary um, and actually you can bring impact into that story uh, you know we're going to try and try and do that yeah uh, great question sam um and um, 
there is a wind of change in public uh, procurement. You know, there's that, this is just one example where I think social enterprises can 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 uh, compete. There is, uh, but there are some um, barriers which I'm going to talk about as well, which we maybe can work on uh, together. Um, is that there is a, a, a movement to increase the weighting of social impact and environmental impact criteria. So we've been involved in Fix Our Food in the government consultation around public food procurement uh, to try and make that more orientated towards local, smaller, medium-sized businesses as well as social enterprises to increase the weighting in the tender document around social and environmental criteria. We've submitted evidence to the EFRA committee uh, that's looking at this. Um, the consultation is, is ongoing. And, um, but I do think that these businesses do need a toolkit. It's one of the things we've discovered is because they're fearful of the kind of documentation process, you know, the tendering, they don't know how to do it. I'm just picking that as an example of a market where, where I could pick private sector retailers as well, but I, I'm, I'm looking at this at the moment. Um, so they do need help, they need confidence. They also maybe need to work together and aggregate because one of the things that bigger suppliers have, they can deliver X amount of eggs or X amount of Y, you know, to, to a particular uh, institution, whereas small, medium-sized enterprises might not be able to deliver the whole of the, so they might need to aggregate and technology might be useful in that, in that respect, you know, like a dynamic platform, for example. Um, so they do need they do need help, but I think there's a movement towards, you know, kind of looking at criteria that does that does that does encourage them in into markets because I think having that diversity in the economy uh, provides resilience, uh, and and so I think there's a story there we, that we can work on together. Thanks, Sanjay. I, I think all the other panelists have probably made all the good points, so I'm left with the remnants. Um, uh, I think from uh, from an ESG perspective, actually, the S bit is the bit that's least well developed in terms of impact metrics. So it, I think that means that when you're trying to sell and tell a story to uh, customers and investors, it's much harder to tell that story with a lingua franca that everyone understands. Uh, so I think that's a challenge. The, the other challenge I've seen, and it's probably more more in the third sector, but a little bit as well in, in social enterprises, is, is look the, the, that so you know, people, well, people maybe don't realize it's the third sector. The charities are, are the most competitive places, right? Uh, uh, there, I've met loads of geniuses in the charity sector uh, running two-man bands, but they've got the answer to all the world's problems, right? And this is part of the challenge is that people come into things with great intentions, but the road to hell is also paved with great intentions. Uh, and it's how you can translate those great intentions into the language of business. And this is about doing well by doing good. There is an emphasis on doing well. And actually, so some of the things that need to be brought across, I've seen in the third sector, and also I think it's increasingly gonna be a challenge for the social enterprises, is that organizational discipline that you get from the corporate world of how you deliver things, how you think about your strategy, how you think about the markets, the way in which you articulate your story. You know, th those are actually good things. <laughs> it's just, you know, good organisational discipline. It's not mimicking the corporate world. Great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I think there's, there's one question I want to ask right at the very end. But before that, I think there's time for one more question from the audience. I'm conscious I've taken three questions from men so far. So if there's anybody who isn't a man and wants to ask you a question, because there's a much more balanced audience than the questions that we've had so far. Excellent. Um, uh, question and I'm afraid this will be the final question of the audience because I promised I would bring this on, in on time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm thinking about how this translates down to the individual level. So we've we've said or you've said a lot about uh, how the role of universities is changing and how we have such an important uh, role in society and for business. How does that translate to to the individual levels? As in, what does the ideal academic of probably the future? look like it sometimes feels like we're being pulled into a thousand different directions we have to educate the leaders of the future we have to uh, publish the, the high-ranking papers publications on business we have to advise business we have to advise um, uh, in the public arena what for you what does the ideal academic within that setting of what you've been talking about look like great the ideal academic of the future this is a big question 
Um, I'd like you to keep your answers to about 30 seconds, if that is possible, just so that we bring this in on time. I'm going to go to Shardy first. If that's sure. Okay. Um, I would say, you know, delivering intellectually rigorous, rigorous work that is grounded in the, in the real world. So delivering work that is not only useful, but used. Excellent. I love how succinct that answer is. Sanjay. Uh, I think it's about having a team rather than every, every academic has to have exactly the same skills. You need to deliver all of those things you said, but across a team. So developing a team mentality that you can deliver all of those things and identifying where are the gaps in your team. Excellent. Uh, Erin, I'm coming to you, mate. I mean, for me, the best academics I've seen have had a passion that's guided them, have had a particular vision that's guided them and built a career around it. And if you're particularly lost, I've got a one syllable word, which is look to Bob. <laughs> no pressure, Bob. What's the answer? <laughs> it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant question, uh, uh, Melanie. I, I would say uh, collaborate. You've got to be a collaborator, whether that's internally across the university or externally with, uh, you know, with the different economic sector partners. Plus, I think going back to what Erin says, I think you've got to have a passion to unpack a particular problem, you know, shed light on a, on, on a, on a, on a, on a problem area or, or, or an area that's going to have an impact. Um, that for me and, and, and collaborate. I mean, I've always worked in teams. And I think collaboration is really, is really important. There you go. So be passionate, be useful, <laughs> be a collaborator, <laughs> and be Bob. <laughs> no, I'm taking from that. Don't be me. <laughs> um, I want to ask one final question before I draw it to a close. And I just want to make sure we finish on a positive note. It's actually been a very positive and can-do uh, discussion, which has been terrific. Um, but uh, as I said right at the very beginning, that these are really big, profound challenges. And we, you focused on some of the things we need to shift, whether that's getting better at the D and R&D, whether that's big shifts in the capital market, changes in structures and rules around business, getting out of our silos, for, all from your opening remarks. Um, I want to finish just by asking each of you, and I'll go back through the, the same order that we started with. Um, can you name something that just is giving you hope that we have the ability to address these big challenges ahead of us? The fact that we're having these conversations, it indicates a willingness to do things differently. So you say that the first step in 12-step recovery program is acceptance that you have a problem. I think we've achieved acceptance. Uh, of course, the other 11 steps are much harder, um, but we've achieved acceptance. That's, quite, that's, the most, that's the hardest step. And I think we've done the hardest step because we've got the willingness. Yeah. Shall we? I have two short answers. The first thing that gives me hope is that someone else brought up public procurement before I did. I have a secret obsession with the boring revolution which is taking place in council offices and, and government departments across the country. Um, so I think that that honestly really does give me hope that there are internal change makers kind of beavering away at this um, in, in offices everywhere. And, and the second thing is, you know, this is, um, so starting last week, I'm in Bristol, Grimsby, York, Manchester, Plymouth, Southampton, um, and Wakefield, all before Christmas, having conversations about places and institutional investors and how we can um, make places better and improve people's lives. And I think, you know, that the, that feeling of not only acceptance, but but that momentum is building um, gives gives me hope and, and you know, gives me a, a little light when I'm sitting on delayed trains and trying to navigate change strikes. <laughs> what gives you hope, Erin? I'm, I'm going to build on Sanjay's point. What gives me hope is A, that acceptance of the problem, but B, the acceptance that we're not going to solve the problem with 20th century outdated models of business, finance, policy, education, academia. And 10 years ago, when I would talk about alternative new models of ownership, new models of governance, different board structures, different financial mechanisms to drive impact, I would look a bit like a lunatic in a room. Nowadays, it feels like people agree this, we have to completely transform the fundamentals of our economy if we want it to behave differently and pursue different goals. So just the reception people have now to that very big, hairy, audacious observation that 20th century economics is not fit for purpose for 21st century challenges. 
Yeah, uh, how, how do you follow that? Um, young people, we do a lot of work with young people in, uh, in the Fix Our Food program, schools across Yorkshire. And they're, um, they're, they're, if you give them the voice and, and, and design, redesign the curriculum around bringing dietary health together with climate health, um, and you empower them, they'll work with the caterers, work with the, the school teams to change the menus. You know, actually young people, but if you want long-term change, we have to work with uh, younger people. And then th the other one, I, I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of uh, all this kind of stuff around net zero. Uh, I know it's controversial because I think you, 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 you were trying to achieve the minimum level. Uh, I'm, I'm more into carbon negative. Let's achieve carbon negative. Uh, net zero is just, you, you, you're setting yourself up to fail, in my opinion. So the, the local economic partnership as a route map for carbon negative. Uh, and I think we'd have to be bolder in our thinking. Um, let's not just go for the minimal uh, minimum level. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, please, could you show your appreciation to all of our panelists for a fantastic conversation this evening? And um, uh, I'm delighted now to welcome up Professor Sharon Grace, Deputy Dean of the school here, and to, for some closing remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Good evening, everybody. It's lovely to be here. Um, Bob asked me to just say a few words to wrap up things for tonight. Um, I want to thank all of you first for coming, for what's been a really lively and constructive, and I think essentially optimistic um, conversation. So good start, I think. I wanted to thank Paul for chairing the panel so elegantly and Sanjay, Shadi and Rich and Bob for sharing their thoughts on how we can all collaborate most effectively to achieve public good. I think you'll agree that in their work, they clearly demonstrate that there is a different way to run a business and organization across all the different sectors, public, governmental, private and third sector. And that way can forefront ethical policy and practice and aim for long term transformative change, as well as making some money potentially. And I think those are values and goals that we want to emulate going forward in our new school. So it's great to hear that we have some other people out there who feel the same way. And it's inspiring and challenging to hear what they have to say. And I hope it's the start of many conversations to come in the future. Um, a few things that um, chimed with me, particularly Sanjay's challenge to us to build a culture of dialogue, an increasingly difficult thing, I think, to do in this polarised debate world we now live in. But I think as a university and as academics, it's absolutely essential that we create in our students, future leaders, who are innovative, agile, inclusive, and who listen. And I think that's gonna be a real challenge for all of us, but let's give it a go. Shadi challenged us to make our civic mission in the city of York central to our philosophy. And I think we're all really keen and on the local as well as the global. And I think we can do that to share a vision for the city, to be involved in that vision and also to have reducing inequalities at the central of that vision. I think people think York is this lovely middle-class place, but it has essential you know, problems of inequality like everywhere else, and we can play a good part there. Erinch's ideas around new models of ownership, governance, financial planning in businesses, really I know will chime with a lot of my management colleagues in the room tonight. And I think the idea of transformation, not tweaking, is really exciting. We have to be bold and brave and ambitious in what we want to do. And Bob, as our new dean, is really setting out the example to all the rest of us in the department to be action oriented cross-sectional academics involved in real world impact. That's what he lives and breathes. So he's leading from the front and as Enrich said, we will do well to follow him in, in his mission. And I think what's clear from tonight's discussions is that you can work across sectors. Most of us have already had experience of that. 
And in fact, you have to, to achieve meaningful social change now. We must endeavour to break down the barriers so that we can move away from our silos, create successful collaborations, so that we all have the same shared purpose. And somehow, for me, that purpose should be aiming fundamentally to make sure that everybody feels safe and secure, that everybody has a decent home, that everybody has a decent living standard and decent work. And I think that prosperity and opportunity needs to be shared for the many, not the few, if you like. And of course, we're creating this new school in our new University for Public Good, very timely, and it feels, you know, part of a great endeavour. But at a time when the world, the world feels increasingly polarised, I think. And so if we can work actively across our different sectors to create policy and practice that's based on evidence, not on ideology, that is solution focused, not about standing on the side and criticising and not doing, and which also centres the lived experience of those most acutely affected by the actions of those in power, then we'd be going in the right direction. And of course, the future is our students. We need to empower them more than anybody else, along with our local, regional and national partners, so we can co-produce our grand challenge work. And we can create in our students advocates for social justice and social progress who will hold the powerful to account for their actions. That's what I want them to go out and do. And I think lots of people will agree. So quite a lot to do then. We can't be sitting around here, we need to go. Sometimes that feels really scary. It feels almost impossible um, when you read the news, but hearing the discussions tonight, I emulate Paul's idea about hope. It does sound like there are people out there that are interested in ethical, transparent investment models, effective challenges to discrimination and regenerative distrib distributive business. And so that is hopeful because we're not alone in this endeavor. We have partners and people that are gonna support us. So thank you very much panel for giving us that hope. And now let's keep our discussion going. There are drinks and refreshments outside, some canopies. So start the conversation and let's go and uh, endeavor for this new bright future. Thank you very much. <laughs>